Yes. Um, by the way, Andrea, abbiamo cambiato um, <laughs> um, idea. We, we have uh, changed um, okay. ideas about how we <laughs> structure our... Okay, so the, the first one to... Um, I mean, the first one is, is you, right? Because the, the first choice was Terius um, uh, starts out and then you take over and so you, you switched. Right. We've changed it a little bit because okay. otherwise the bits would be so so short and okay. we thought it takes too much time if we switch around too often. So okay. Terry will start out and then I take oh. over. But this was the, the first choice, right? So we, we Yeah, but he takes a bit more. It takes a bit more. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise it's too disrupted, probably. Okay. Okay, Manuela, are we online? Are we streaming? Yes, we are online. Okay, perfect. Uh, we have still people getting in. Yeah. This is so exciting. <laughs> um, Elena, can you share the screen so that we start with the yeah. PowerPoint and then uh, in a minute I will, I will introduce. Ciao. Ciao, Teresa. Ciao, Teresa. Ciao. Ciao a tutti. Ciao Maria. Ciao. Colleagues and friends, so welcome to our monthly appointment with the Linguistic Flash Mob. This is our last meeting before the summer holidays. So tonight we have thought of a very broad topic, which we hope is of general interest to our linguistic community and its heritage language. To discuss it, we have invited Tanya Kupisch from the University of Konstanz and Terry Londal from the University of Trondheim. Tonight's moderator is Andrea Padovan from the University of Verona. As usual, for security reasons, the chat, microphone, and screen sharing functions have been disabled during the debate. So the chat will be active at the end for you to write if you intend to ask a question, and we will enable your microphone. Those of you who won't be able to ask your questions can send it to me via email to the following address, ceciliapoletto at gmail.com. I will collect the questions and send them to the speakers for a later reply. Uh, and for those of you who are uh, hearing us on YouTube, you can write to me and I will ask you questions and uh, I will make sure that, you know, they are asked uh, in, the, in, in the Zoom room. And now I leave the floor to tonight's moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. <clears throat> welcome, everybody. And welcome uh, to our speakers, to our discussants, uh, Tania and Terrier. Um, and today's discussion, today's flash mob, uh, will, will be focusing on heritage languages, as you, as you have seen. What are they? What is a heritage speaker? Well, roughly speaking, when, when we talk about heritage speakers, we're basically dealing with uh, um, unbalanced bilinguals whose stronger language is the dominant language spoken in their society. The other language is, of course, the one they usually speak in their households, and, and it is normally a, a minority language. 
Um, in the past few years, a great deal of research has been devoted to this topic, and we can actually say that heritage languages have stolen the limelight, as it were, for their remarkable contribution to, um, um, to bilingualism studies in general, but also to linguistic theory in general. Um, concepts such as unbalanced bilingualism, attrition, language context, or the influence exerted by a dominant language have been playing a leading role in this field and in this field of study and they're now commonplace i would say in general heritage speakers competence exhibits a great deal of variation but there are also regularities and this is quite interesting for example in grammatical paradigms or uh, we should mention the fact that uh, heritage speakers have difficulties in dealing with silent categories to name one for all these characteristics, these speakers are particularly attractive to linguists who are basically uh, kind of addressing key questions like what kind of changes can heritage speakers grammar undergo? What subsystems are likely to be disrupted in some way? So as you can see, these are hot topics. And, and I think, I really think that we are all looking forward to today's flash mob. So uh, without further ado, I leave the floor to our discussants and uh, the first question that we are going to address is the following. What is your definition of heritage grammar and how do heritage grammars contribute to the understanding of language capacity? I guess Terje is, um, uh, is going to address first this question. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for uh, showing up uh, on, a, um, on a summer evening. Um, and thank you for um, um, taking part in the discussion about heritage grammars and the three questions that we've uh, we've gotten. So um, uh, the first part now uh, is about defining what a heritage grammar is, which Andrea partly uh, already did, uh, and then speak about what heritage grammars contribute to the understanding of the language capacity. So here's a way of thinking about um, about heritage speakers. Um, and this is a way of fleshing out what uh, Andrea uh, essentially said. Uh, they are minority language speakers in a majority language environment, and they are bilinguals. Um, and by the time they are adults, heritage speakers tend to be dominant, um, which you can think of as being more proficient in the language of their larger national uh, community. It should also be added that uh, some of us think of heritage speakers as real native speakers. That is that they have acquired their heritage variety in a native uh, way. That doesn't mean that they speak exactly like what you would expect from a given baseline. And there's a lot of discussion in the literature uh, about what constitutes a proper baseline. And we'll return to that as we, um, as we go along. But it's quite important for many reasons. And I think Tanya will touch on this as well, uh, that heritage speakers are actually native speakers of their heritage variety. So um, let's look at what possible contributions um, studying heritage grammars can make. So here are just a few things which I think are among the highlights. So uh, first of all, they're part of the linguistic ecology. So they're a type of speakers that we need to understand and model. So they need to be included in our linguistic theories, uh, whatever uh, they turn out to be. Because the heritage grammars enable us to provide better models of human linguistic competence, which includes cases where multiple grammars are in contact within the same mind brain. Since humans are readily um, capable of mastering multiple languages, we want to try to understand what that means and how our formal models of uh, the human linguistic competence look like once we start including these kinds of speakers as well. Of course, alongside other types of multilingual speakers as well. Heritage grammars also enable us to study intra-individual variation within native grammars because there is quite a lot of variation. And um, as we'll see, I think today, uh, heritage speakers also uh, vary quite a bit. Um, they don't um, produce their language in the same kind of um, regular-like fashion as, as uh, other um, speakers, uh, with exceptions, of course. Uh, the third property is that we can use heritage grammars to try to identify core syntactic properties. So what properties remain stable when the input is uh, reduced or different compared to the input that other speakers receive, be it monolingual speakers or balanced bilinguals or 
or what have you. So um, heritage grammars, of course, come in different flavors. And at least for those speakers who don't get that much input, uh, we can see what happens uh, with their grammar under those conditions. And this also includes the role of defaults because heritage um, speakers often resort to defaults, um, although here there's, there's some variation as well. We'll get back to the notion of defaults later on. Um, they also provide a complementary window onto the debate about universals vari uh, versus variable properties of language. And that, of course, is related to these core syntactic properties, but they might speak to the uh, two properties that uh, that are more universal in the language system, because what heritage speakers do in when faced with reduced input or reduced usage uh, may tell us something about uh, what those uh, universe, universal properties are. And there are lots of scholars who have attempted to draw uh, generalizations uh, concerning universal properties based on heritage speakers um, production and competence. And then lastly, uh, we might also want to highlight that heritage speakers allow investigations into the nature of language change in real time, uh, because they often um, display a change compared to a relevant baseline. We'll get back to that uh, later on, so I won't um, spend more time on it right here. But I want to give you an example of uh, what we can use um, heritage language data to, theoretically speaking. So we know that many bilinguals uh, mix uh, their languages that they speak. And this happens even more so in heritage speakers because their dominant language uh, is often quite strong and they often have lexical access issues with, uh, with their minority or heritage language. Um, and that means that they mix, um, mix the two language, uh, languages quite often. And that's quite a gold mine uh, if you want to look at the grammatical patterns that emerge. And some of us have been doing this and, and looked at mixing from a formal perspective. There's a longer history, of course, going back to the 70s, and there's no time to review that history here. The two citations here on the second bullet point provides uh, fairly comprehensive reviews together, I think. Um, but the point is that language mixing has, for example, recently been used to probe the inner structure of words. So what are the basic units that words consist of? Um, and what we've seen across these studies so far is that this data support the decompositional view of morphology, whereby morphemes are the realizations of abstract syntactic features, and these morphemes seem to be assembled syntactically. And I'll just give you a glimpse of this, um, which is an argument that uh, at some level you have categoryless roots, uh, which are recognized in multiple frameworks. So this in and of itself doesn't speak in, in favor of one particular framework. But here you have examples from the heritage language, American Norwegian, where the same minimal unit uh, occurs as a noun and a verb in all three, uh, so in, in all three pairs. Um, so if we look at fence, you have the past tense form or the participle form of fence, uh, where the English fence is combined with Norwegian morphology. Uh, whereas in the second example, you have the English word, which is uh, assigned grammatical gender, since Norwegian has three different genders, including American Norwegian. Um, and we see that they spontaneously uh, give grammatical properties to these, um, to these units. And you can replicate the same examples uh, for various uh, units. Here, we just have fence, mo, and vote. Um, and in all cases, this minimal English, English-like unit can appear with Norwegian-like morphology. And that suggests that in these cases, um, you have a root that combines with a functional uh, category that categorizes it either as a verb or as a noun. And there are various questions about exactly how that categorization happens. There are multiple analysis available on the table. Um, but at least this is one way of using heritage language and the mixing that they, or heritage grammars and the mixing uh, within those uh, to get at a core issue in linguistic theory uh, from a different angle and with a different kind of argumentation than what we typically see in, uh, in a lot of lit literature. So we can actually get some crucial insight into the nature of the minimal units of words if we look at this kind of, of data. So that's one example. Uh, and that was my um, way of answering the first question. So I'll stop sharing and turn it over to Tanya.
Thanks very much, Teria. And um, yeah, uh, I would also like to thank the organizers. And I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Um, it's a great honor. So um, yeah, I will give my version of the story, which is a bit similar to what Teria has said, but differs in some respects. So uh, let me come to the definition of heritage grammar. So for me, heritage grammar is the grammar of a native speaker who grew up bilingually speaking in a minority language at home, which is not part of the larger national society. This bears, this definition bears re resemblance with that given by Jason Rothman, but as you can see, a lot of other people have given the same definition, but you will see that I have underlined the term native here. It's It was very important for me to stress that, and I think um, Jason, from whom I have stolen this definition, will agree to me, although he didn't use it that way. Um, for me, uh, heritage grammars also include not only migrant minorities, but also colonial languages, indigenous languages, and also dialects. And if you would like me to elaborate on this last point, I'll be happy to do that in the discussion. And I would also like to point to some misconceptions that you find in the literature. Um, there have been confusions of nativeness with dominance and or convergence on a standard. So for example, you find the view that you are a heritage speaker because you don't converge on a standard or if you converge on a standard, you're no more a heritage speaker. You also find the view that you are a heritage speaker of a language if that language is your weaker language. If you speak it as your stronger language, that is no more a heritage language. And I don't think that is, is correct in that way. For me, heritage means inherited, that is passed on by the previous generation or generations. And um, uh, it's, it's possible that you speak your minority language as your stronger language. And strong for me means um, more proficient. Um, you can find these cases, although of course they are rare, as rare as um, um, perfectly balanced bilinguals are. But for me, um, uh, crucially, heritage speakers reach native attainment in adulthood because they are native speakers by definition. And I will try to defend this point later on. Um, so how do heritage grammars uh, contribute to the understanding of the language capacity? I, I have uh, four points here. One is theoretical implications. The second point is vulnerable domains or sensitive periods. I'll say more about sensitive periods than vulnerable domains, but again, I can come back to this later on. Um, limitations of the language capacity and language change, and I'll go through these one by one. So I think most people agree that different types of language acquisition provide insights into the nature of the human language capacity. And um, in different theoretical frameworks, this language capacity has been conceptualized in different ways. So if we look at Sloban, he calls it the language making capacity. He would assume that the LMC is subserved by biological and cognitive mechanisms, which are not only human specific, they can be human specific or shared with other species. And the assumption is that this LMC becomes available through neural maturation, provided it is activated and activation requires sufficient exposure. And I'll also come back to the point of sufficient exposure. Um, so um, Chomsky has a slightly different version. He calls it language acquisition device. And um, as you know, it's understood as involving only domain specific mechanisms, which are exclusive to the acquisition and processing of formal properties of human languages. And I think this makes this account makes um, more interesting predictions because one example, at least to my understanding, that is that it predicts differences between formal and non-formal properties. And one example would be uh, grammar uh, or syntactic properties um, as compared to vocabulary. And this is exactly what is found in or has been found in bilingual language acquisition data already in the, in the 1990s. You can find examples, for example, by Fred Genesey and um, colleagues at, at McGill University. They have looked at English French children and they found that in terms of um, the verb raising, verb raising properties, um, these bilingual children behaved exactly like monolingual children in French and in English, whereas with in terms of vocabulary acquisition, they, they um, were behind monolinguals. So here you can see how um, certain accounts make more precise predictions, or at least um, if you want to put it in a neutral way, they make different predictions. 
Um, the second point is stable or vulnerable domains in sensitive periods. Um, most people probably agree that bilingual children in principle can acquire native competence in two or even three languages, but um, they don't always do so. Um, the fact that they can just means that, I mean, it doesn't just mean, but it means that our brains are in principle capable of doing that. Um, sometimes it doesn't happen um, because there can be age of onset effects if a language is acquired too late. And um, there is some controversies. There are some controversies in what exactly these age of onset effects consist in, but most people agree that not all of language is affected. I think uh, vocabulary would be such a such an, an area which is not affected by age of onset effects. Um, and the second point is that not all domains are affected at the same time or simultaneously. Um, and the proposal here has been that there are certain sensitive phases in grammar development. So, for example, um, Jürgen Meiser has proposed that the sensitive period for um, the acquisition of gender would be between three and four, whereas um, the sensitive period for um, uh, word, word order properties is slightly later than that. So um, the point here is that um, if you are a later second language learner, there's too little input during the early period. And um, for heritage speakers, I think the opposite is the case. So you have too little input, but during a later stage, um, because heritage speakers, as you know, um, there the problem is that they have more input during their early years and once they enter school, they get more massively exposed to the dominant language of the society. And in cases where input ceases uh, completely, there can be effects of attrition. Um, for example, Christina Flores has shown that um, uh, if input ceases completely be before the age of 11, um, that can have severe effects. So, and the fact that she finds a cutoff point at the age of 11, um, points to sensitive periods, not only in acquisition, but only, but also for attrition. It also shows that there's probably a period of stabilization. So in the sense that um, not all of grammar is complete or you're not done at the age of four or five, but there are periods in which you, your grammar has to stabilize. If, and if in that period, the input is reduced, this can have consequences. And um, the, the point I want to make here is that the idea of sensitive periods is also testable with heritage speakers. And more specifically, you would probably assume that they have no, proper, they have no problems with early acquired properties, which probably also uh, correspond to um, the core areas. Um, for example, word order properties shouldn't be so problematic, but they should have more problems with late acquired properties because at the later stages when they have less exposure. Um, the second point um, is actually the third point I want to make are limitations of language capaci capacity. So um, it has been frequently, if you look at the literature on heritage language acquisition, many people have claimed that there can be divergent acquisition some people have called it incomplete. Um, I prefer the term um, divergent, and that this is due to insufficient or poor exposure. The problem is that um, until this point, we don't know what insufficient and poor actually means in, as compared to sufficient or rich exposure. And um, that's, of course, something that we would like to know. Um, why would we like to know? Because we want to know about the limits of the language capacity, uh, we want to know how little input is too little. And um, maybe it's not simultaneous or um, bilinguals with two languages that will tell us um, how little input is too little, but probably it's, it's rather trilingual children because their input space is even more severely um, restricted. And why do we want to know? Because we want to uh, tell educators and parents we want to tell them um, what the answer to this question is. We want to feed back into society. And the last point I want to make um, on, on this first question is uh, concerned with language change. Um, many people have um, claimed that heritage language data can foreshadow diachronic change in monolingual settings. And um, in a recent or in a <laughs> paper in process um, with Masha Polinski, we have uh, we have tried to show that heritage language data provides us with opportunities to zoom into. It's like a magnifying glass that can change, that can show us language change scenarios 
that normally happen over a very long period of time. And I'll just give one example, um, the evolution of articles. So from, as you know, from Latin to modern romance, the articles have developed and it took about a thousand years. And um, there's um, very nice work by um, Walter Broy on um, Molise Slavic, um, which is a variety spoken in a few villages in Italy, uh, serbo croatian variety. The ancestors of the contemporary speaker came from Dalmatia, probably about 500 years ago. And since then, the language has been under the influence of the Molesian dialect and um, more recently, uh, probably by standard Italian. But the point is it was completely isolated and in a stage of extreme language contact. And it has developed articles in less than half of the time. So less than 500 years for this language to develop articles. And um, that was my answer to the first question. And I'll um, leave the floor. I'll stop here. And thank, thank you both. So before moving on, just a small thing, Tanya. So um, I think you were sharing the, uh, the presentation mode. You, you had the presentation mode on. Okay. So could you please uh, make sure you, you will use the uh, full screen mode? Yes, uh, yes. Thank you. I didn't want to interrupt you, so I can see. Ah, it. sorry. And I thought I had tried it out before, but um, yeah, you could have interrupted me, no problem. Okay, thank you. So we can move on to the, to the next question, which reads, do heritage grammars evolve over time or do they reach a plateau? So I guess uh, Teria is again going to ask first, uh, to, to answer first. Yes. Thank you. Um, so um, in thinking about this question, um, we first have to make the distinction between thinking about individual grammars or what I've called group level generalizations here. So I think the question is really about individual grammars, what happens within an individual. But a lot of the research that's out there is really more on a group level uh, type of, um, of approach. And there are reasons for that, uh, not at least that it's much easier to do it and it's doable. Whereas uh, doing individual grammar studies across a long time period uh, is quite uh, challenging. But it can be done if you have the adequate resources. So, um, so even if they're rare, you come across them. And um, the empirical theme for this uh, talk is uh, American Norwegian. So I'll continue uh, sticking to that because that's what I've done uh, mo the most work on. Uh, and there is a recent study actually, which does this in a remarkable way. So uh, the Norwegian linguist Arnstein Yelda uh, looked at, uh, looked at uh, Einar Haugen's last living male speaker of American Norwegian. And we have a recording of him from 1948 when he was 18 years old. And Yelda went back to the US and recorded him again in 2017 uh, at the age of 88. So we have this remarkable time period uh, where it's possible to look at changes in his grammar. And there are three things that I've highlighted here that Yelda finds in his, um, in his data. The first is the remarkable uh, lower processing speed that the speaker has, which is partly due to aging, of course, but it's not just due to aging. He hadn't spoken Norwegian for years when, when Yelda was able to find him. Um, and he has, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that he has more frequent code switches into English. So he has less, um, um, he has huge lexical access problems for his Norwegian vocabulary, or it might have disappeared altogether. So he's using English words a lot. Um, and lastly, and this is quite interesting, that Yelda finds that his topicalization pattern is stable. So it, it's at the same level as say Norwegian or Swedish. Um, contemporarily speaking. But interestingly enough, he finds that verb second is still vulnerable in the last recording. Not at all in the first recording, V2 is in place as you would expect, but in the set last recording, uh, it's uh, vulnerable. And this is interesting because also because it, it contradicts a finding that, um, that Mart Vestergaard, Bjorn Lundqvist and I found where we looked at 50 speakers uh, and at, at a group level, it looked like topicalization and verb second were actually correlated uh, statistically. Uh, so if you had topicalization 
uh, or retain topical, topicalization of the European type, you also had verb second. And if you didn't have topicalization of the Norwegian type, so non-subject initial declaratives, you also struggled with verb second. So that's an interesting and, and a case study of what can happen across the lifespan of an individual speaker. And there are a few other cases out there, but it's hard to find, um, to find careful studies that goes across a long time period. And this, of course, is an exceptionally long time period. Group level studies are therefore easier to do, and, and you'll find quite a few of them. So here, um, I'll just highlight one example where uh, Brita Rixam compares aspects of the DP in Haugen's work from 1953 um, with speakers from this new corpus of American Norwegian that has been established in the last decade. And that's quite uh, interesting. Haugen looked at uh, 200 speakers roughly and provided very solid uh, generalizations. And now we can look at, um, at the generalizations today. And she looked at language mixing as well of the same type that I provided examples of when addressing the first question. And she found three changes basically between what Haugen reports and what the speakers do in the new corpus. Uh, the first is that they have an increased usage of the English plural S. Uh, which doesn't exist in Norwegian. Uh, they omit functional suffixes, both in the plural and in definite phrases. So you don't have the post-nominal definite suffix, characteristic of Norwegian, for example, in many of them. And they have an increased use of the English determiner, the. And those are, again, group level findings, but they are, of course, indicative of changes in the grammars of these individuals as well, because presumably their input was something like the Haugen uh, input because Haugen speakers were recorded in the 1930s, 1940s, and those would be the parents of the speakers in this new uh, corpus. And then the question is, what is actually changing? So here we can use uh, heritage language data to address uh, the question of what is actually changing in their representation. Is there a change in the syntactic structure? As some people have argued, do they actually just have a different nominal phrase with different functional projections um, because they haven't received enough input or sustained language sufficiently um, during this time period? Or is it the case that uh, what's actually changing is the mapping from syntactic structures and features to the morphophonological exponents. So it becomes an interface uh, problem. And Rixam in her paper argues for the latter, um, but you can, I mean, that's, that it's, it's not a settled question because you can, you can see uh, arguments in favor of both uh, analyses. And you can imagine cases where both of these things happen at the same time. So it's not the fact that one option excludes the other, but we're able to look at those questions in real time, in a sense, uh, which we wouldn't be able to do uh, necessarily or as easily uh, in a non-heritage study. So that's, um, that's one way of approaching, uh, approaching this question, with the overall message being that, yeah, there are changes across the lifespan, um, but it's actually very hard to find solid documentation of exactly what those changes are and fine-grained mappings of the changes within a formal, uh, formal perspective. So that was my uh, answer to the question, and I'll stop and leave it uh, to Tanya, please. Thank you, Tanya. And um, I hope this time I will share the right screen. Let's see. Now it should be okay. I'm looking at Andrea. Perfect. perfect. Thank, you. perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. The question here is, do heritage grammars evolve over time or do they reach a plateau? And I would like to start by saying, why do we even talk about a plateau? Um, so if I hear plateau, I'm thinking about what, what you see on this picture. And um, I'm also thinking about there's an alternative to the plateau, namely a peak. And I think typically people associate the peak the, with the utmost thing that you can reach. That is the golden standard that only monolingual speakers can reach. And um, that's why I do not like the term plateau so much, and I prefer the term final state instead of plateau. And I'll give you some arguments why. So um, in short, I'm thinking that the plateau may come up because people tend to think heritage speakers do not reach full competence because their grammars look different. And different here means different from monolinguals. And I think this is wrong. Instead, we should be surprised if heritage speakers' grammars look like those 
um, we should be surprised if they looked exactly like those of monolinguals. Why? Because as Talia has just pointed out, languages undergo change and restructuring, regardless of whether they are um, grammars of monolinguals or bilinguals. And we also know that restructuring is preceded by variation, and that explains why heritage speakers are more um, reluctant to say something is ungrammatical. And variation is something that um, we also find in monolingual settings, but in monolingual settings, it typically um, gets, gets corrected through mechanisms that our societies have developed to, to protect the language. So as soon as you go to school, you learn that there's only one way of speaking correctly. Um, so in monolingual settings, of course, things um, don't have the chance to change so fast. And the last point, which um, Talia has just mentioned, is that, of course, heritage speakers have different exposure. Um, so um, I also want to point out that some people do not believe um, neither in final states nor in plateaus. Um, they think that languages change forever. I do believe that you reach a certain stage um, in which your grammar is relatively stable. But nevertheless, of course, your language can go on changing, especially in terms of vocabulary that will grow forever, maybe slower once you grow older, but it will continue to grow. You might um, acquire formal registers and um, you may also change your intonation or your phonology if you move to a different part of the country. Um, so, but um, crucially, heritage grammars evolve over time, just like other first languages, and they do reach a final state that is relatively stable. And at this final state, they may come in different shades and colors. And one version, one color in which they can come is um, the same as a monolingual grammar. I've seen this with um, French heritage speakers in Germany who often attend um, uh, French schools. They go to the Lycée Francais where they get instructed, they get education in French, although they still live in a German speaking environment and they develop exactly the same language abilities as people in France with uh, less input. Another version is that um, the, the final state can be akin, that it can be the same as any other baseline, but this baseline is not the monolingual baseline, but the baseline that um, you find in some dialect, because, um, for example, heritage speakers of uh, Italian in Germany, they, um, they're exposed to varieties of Italian, and sometimes not only to varieties of Italian, but varieties of Italian that were spoken in Italy some 40 years ago. And the third um, version, uh, the first um, version is the restructured grammar that Teria has talked about that you people have found a lot of evidence for in the Germanic heritage languages um, spoken in the fourth or fifth generation in North America. And of course, heritage speakers may then decide to continue learning their heritage language in a formal or non-formal setting. The question is if then this corresponds more to um, late second language acquisition or first language acquisition. And since um, uh, it takes some time to switch, I will also move on to the third question and answer this very briefly. Are there limits to the innovations that we can find in heritage grammars? Um, I think um, uh, that heritage grammars show the same properties that we also find in second language acquisition and first language acquisition. So there's nothing that you can find that is not um, found in any other natural languages. At the same time, I think the innovations that we find are somewhat predictable or constrained, if you find, if you prefer that term, because they often show the properties of the contact language, and they also differ more um, from um, baselines in um, the interface, in the interfaces, and they differ less in the core areas of grammar, or put differently, they differ less in the properties that, that are typically early acquired and they differ more in the properties that are typically late acquired. And um, the last point, which Teria has also commented on, is that um, they often mirror typical patterns of diachronic change. And here I will leave the floor to Teria again. Thank you, Tanya. So um, the question of limitations. So um, 
I think, especially for those who, who are not intimately familiar with all this uh, literature, I just want to give a glance of what are the kind of generalizations of concerning innovations in the sense that have been proposed uh, regarding uh, what I hear call stable and vulnerable domains. So the first one is, is what Tanya mentioned as well. Uh, and it, here is just a quote from, um, from a target article in theoretical linguistics uh, um, soon 10 years ago, that syntactic knowledge, particularly the knowledge of phrase structure and word order appears to be more resilient to changes instead of the words that are on the slide than inflectional morphology is. Uh, and there is a tendency for heritage language speakers to retain the basic, perhaps universal core structural properties of their language. So again, syntax seems to be rather uh, resilient, um, even under conditions of reduced input. So that tells us something about the relative stability of syntactic features as opposed to morphophonological exponents, which are really uh, harder to, uh, to sustain and that more easily change. This doesn't mean, of course, that syntactic features cannot change. Uh, so we see that verb second changes um, uh, in some sense, in, in some varieties, and there are other aspects that people have argued for as well, uh, but they're, relatively speaking, rarer than morphophonological changes. Um, and there is a prevalence for defaults, as I mentioned uh, in, in response to the first question, namely that um, speakers tend to go for whatever the default is, or they make a new default, which might not be the default in, in, uh, in the monolingual um, baseline uh, that you might think of. Um, so when we uh, think of the nature of innovations, we have to ask the question, well, innovations compared to what? And here the question of a baseline as Tanya has also discussed becomes very imperative. Do you want to compare it just to the monolingual? Most people agree that that's not in general a suitable baseline, but then what kind of baseline do you have available? So for the American Norwegian speakers, this is quite tricky uh, because we don't have sufficient evidence across the generations that we can use that as a baseline. So we often resort to the dialect spoken in Norway 100 years ago in the area that they came from. And of course, that's an approximation. But we want to look, we, we need a baseline of some sort. And, and sometimes that's the best we can do, especially with, with those generations. So you have to try to identify a sensible baseline, which can also undergo changes. This is something that Tanya also covered. Um, and of course, we know that innovations can also occur in monolingual grammar. So we have to be sensitive to that, often related to specific registers. And then that can spread into uh, heritage varieties as well. Uh, this is the, the really important part of the RUEG uh, project uh, that Heike Wiese and, and others are running in, in um, Berlin. Of course, innovations might be accelerated compared to other instances of language change, but fundamentally they are of the same type as Tanya also said. Uh, and some of you might be thinking of the rich uh, tradition of identifying constraints on code switching or language mixing. Um, whether there are actually restrictions on such patterns is an independent topic. And if you want an, an up-to-date discussion, uh, Luis Lopez in his uh, most recent book has a nice appendix uh, summarizing all that discussion and essentially concluding that there are restrictions, but not restriction, restrictions that are unique to language mixing. So currently there seem to be no clear cases where heritage grammars display unique innovations but they may amplify or overextend innovations compared to other groups. Um, and, and here, uh, Roberta de Alessandro's ERC project and the work that group is doing is quite important because they're finding heritage speakers in Italy who don't do many of the things that have been claimed to be the general patterns. And that raises a whole uh, cascade of questions about why they find differences and what that tells us about the previous studies as well and so on, which we could talk about. Uh, but lastly, and finally, um, in order to answer the question that the organizers have posed, we really need formal and explicit models to answer the question. So you need to look carefully at the grammatical representations to make adequate uh, predictions about what the restrictions are and also good uh, and, uh, and descriptively adequate uh, um, uh, descriptions of what the innovations actually are. So that's just a plug for for use the need for formal and explicit models when studying these grammars, uh, they lend themselves very naturally to that. So with that, um, I think I'm done and thank you very much for, 
for listening and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot uh, to, our, to our speakers. Um, okay, we're more, most, I guess we, we are on time. Um, um, I'm looking for uh, questions. I'm looking for the questions in the chat or if Cecilia wants to um, um, for, forward me the, um, the, uh, the question uh, um, asked in the, in the YouTube platform. Okay, so there's, there's a, raised, the ra a raised hand by Alessandro Tomaselli. Okay, I have two questions, in fact, but I will propose the first question first. As when when uh, Terry said that syntax is more resilient than morphology, did, did I understand well? Because I think we could also uh, see the the opposite situation. For example, if we look to, to the data from Cimbrian, which is not the heritage language, it's a minority language spoken in Northern Italy, but the distinction is not so, so clear for me. We see that, for example, pronominal syntax is much more resilient than word order patterns. So uh, when you lose verb second, you lose the, the linear word order, but you do not, you do not lose the the structural explanation of verb seconds, the mandatory finite verb movement to cope. So in which sense morphology is less resilient than syntax, even because we know from the notion of draft from, from the American structuralists of the last century that morphology is more resistant in some way. So the pronominal system is always more conservative than word order pattern, for example. This is the first question, then I will ask something else. I have time. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's an uh, that's an excellent question, and and I think that that tells us several things uh, about different groups and the nature of the generalizations that have been proposed in the literature. So there is. Um, so I, I still stand by the generalization that if you look across all the studies, uh, syntactic patterns, uh, whatever aspects of syntax we're looking at, tend to be more stable in the sense of not changing compared to the relevant baseline. Um, so that's what, and whereas, you know, the inflectional morphology, derivational morphology to some extent, uh, tend to change more um, easily or more marked in a sense. Um, but then, of course, you have counterexamples um, of the kind that you that you mentioned, and and I want I mean the topic that's being more and more discussed now in the literature is that the generalizations that I reported are largely based on um, heritage languages in contact with English, uh, and I think that might play into this that that the fact that 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 tells us some I mean the population that you have. Um, studied and others have studied, they don't have the same profile in the sense that English is not as prominent. So there is a question if if there is a bias due to all these heritage languages focusing so or having English as the majority language that, that can bias the findings. Because the minute you start looking at other heritage languages where English is not into the mix, we tend to get different patterns. And I think that's to some extent behind uh, Roberta de Alessandro's uh, findings as well, when she claims that, well, they don't remove ambiguity. Uh, the interface hypothesis does not work, as she, uh, as she argues, and they don't avoid silence. They actually overuse uh, null subjects, which also goes against what people have found, especially in the US when looking at English and Spanish. So I think I don't have a, have a full answer to exactly why there are these differences, but I think the nature of the majority language plays probably a more important role than the field has acknowledged so far. But if Tanya also wants to comment. I in any case, inflection and morphology is something different from pronominal syntax. So in, in some way, we have to define morphology in, in a more specialized way, I guess. Yeah. Hey, Tanya, if you want to add something to this. Yeah, I, I want to agree with Tanya, although I shouldn't, but I want to. Um, I think I agree with him that syntax is generally less vulnerable, but I wanted to add an, another point. Um, it doesn't only depend on the majority language, but it also depends on the on the properties of the minority language. So I think the um, the generalization that morphology is so vulnerable it also comes a lot from work on Germanic heritage languages in 
in, um, in North America, where case is extremely vulnerable and gender is extremely vulnerable. But these are also languages which don't have um, German, for example, doesn't have a very transparent case and gender morphology. And for Italian, um, it looks completely different. If you look at Italian children, they can uh, they get verb morphology very, very quickly and they get gender very, very quickly. So I, I do think it's, it also depends on the transparency of um, the morphology in the target language. And then there's an ad additional difference probably between verb morphology and nominal morphology, morphology. But I think the language itself is the most important factor. Okay, thanks a lot. I guess the next one is from Cecilia. Yes, thank you. I generally refrain myself from asking questions, but this time I will. Uh, I was wondering what your definition of default is. Shall I try to say something about that uh, first? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I didn't give a, a, a definition of default. And I think uh, that's in part because you'll find different patterns uh, or different definitions in a lot of different work. And I was trying to summarize the, the generalization. Uh, for many studies, it generally means the unmarked. Um, uh, I mean, the 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 you or the item that expresses the fewest uh, distinctions in a sense uh, for many uh, many of these studies um, uh, so i think you know that's that's the general sense that i was intending uh, default but of course you can go on and and think about what what does does that mean formally uh, how do we encode the notion of a default uh, into the system? Does it mean that there is a value or you know, feature matrix that doesn't get a value? Does it just mean the absence of a value? Uh, there are lots of, of questions that partly depend on, in, on the overall um, framework that you want to work within. Uh, and I have my preferences, um, but, but I don't think there is anything like a consensus out there in um, in the literature, um, but it's yeah. So it's generally being used in in the sense of of marketness, um, I think in in many of these studies. Um, but we should do better, and we should try to to see you know the, what what is generally called default might actually not be default in all these cases. Uh, I think that's an interesting question to think about. Okay, thanks a lot. I think we've got two more raised hands. Uh, the first one is by um, Anna Maria de Schulen, then Alexia Leonidou. Yes, um, thank you very much to both speakers. It was very interesting. I think that um, heritage language are, are, is a complex topic because generally it involves massive data or more data than a theoretical linguist would have, right? more than one example. A lot of data, plus there's the linguistic bias, theoretical linguistic bias to this data, right? So you're going to approach differences between morphology and syntax, depending on your theory about the relation between both or not. And also you're going to approach these things with respect to the general framework, for example, Chomsky framework, right? And recently uh, suggesting that it's all externalization, right? So the, it's, a, it's a very complex approach and um, Interestingly, there might be kind of general property, like, I mean, is there um, a heritage language which would, um, I don't know, um, go against structure dependency? Uh, I mean, this is a general principle that is assumed. I mean, um, and how much variation and the limits of variation you can, uh, you can get. So then again, uh, natural language are, a, you know, biological organism, right, in per se, so they vary always. So what's the property of this living organism that are in contact with other living organism, maybe at the same stage or not, and how it, they change through time, but by definition, by definition, language change, right? So uh, many years ago, I looked at the Italian community in Canada, in Montreal, and at the time it was GB theory, right? So we proposed a government constraint on sites which could be uh, switched and sites which wouldn't. So in a sense, it was a configurational approach to that. And then 
we saw no evidence of variation within quote unquote words, right? In the corpora that we got. So it depends. I mean, I would really be, I would have been interested to know more about the fundamental properties of language and variation that the presenter assumed and in what way they try not to be biased by that because we're trying to find new things about the subject. Uh, uh, in question, right? So is variation uh, syntactically, uh, you know, you know, like feature valuing or anything, or is it externalization? And that's where in the morphology. So if anyone could, you know, of the two could tell me something about these main questions, I would be delighted to hear. Can I just start, uh, started off with two sentences. I think it's impossible not to be biased by your theory because uh, the theory gives you the tool to approach the data. I mean, some people don't believe in, um, in not even in uh, categories, not even in word categories. I mean, then you cannot analyze your language. Um, so at least I couldn't, I wouldn't know where to start. So um, I think by, by necessity, we are biased, but that's also a good thing because um, as you just uh, mentioned with your example of code switching, uh, it's also an opportunity to test these theories. So, um, right, if it doesn't work for the data, if it doesn't explain your, um, it doesn't match your code switching theory, then you have to adjust your, your code switching theory. It doesn't mean it's a bad theory, but it means that it needs a little bit of um, revision. But I think that's, that's the great thing about heritage languages. And of course, I would always assume that um, what you find there is nothing that is completely out of the ordinary, although I, I never worked on code switching. So I, I do know, um, listening to people working on code switching, that you find all kinds of things that you totally don't expect. Um, in language acquisition data, that's not so much the case. Um, so if you look across um, language acquisition patterns, also in child heritage speakers, you generally see, you see the same patterns. Not all reach the same, not all at the same acquisition stages, but they don't do something completely out of the ordinary that is unpredictable. That's the first attempt. Thank you. Um, sorry, Alexa, before giving you the floor, I would like to um, read out a question by uh, Elena Suarez that uh, was written in the chat that reads, uh, when I talk about heritage speakers as, as unbalanced bilinguals, I have colleagues working in bilingualism who reply that there is no such thing as balanced bilingualism and that simultaneous bilinguals can also become unbalanced. I'm afraid that this weakens the definition of uh, heritage speakers and I don't know how to answer to this kind of criticism. Can I respond to this? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I'm not, Elena, I'm not, um, I'm, I don't agree that um, there's anything that weakens the definition of heritage speakers. So, um, and for me, it has nothing to do with simultaneous or sequential bilinguals. You can have um, unbalanced or balanced simultaneous bilinguals, and you can have unbalanced or balanced sequential bilinguals. Um, so, um, and of course, I mean, there's the idea that the perfectly balanced bilingual doesn't exist. And that's probably true. If you go across domains, you will always find some kind of imbalance, but there are more balanced bilinguals and more unbalanced bilinguals, but it doesn't have to do anything with um, simultaneous or sequential. In my experience, and I've seen a lot of heritage speakers, the sequential ones are the ones that end up and, and end up being more balanced because the simultaneous bilinguals have a lot more exposure to the majority language during the crucial years. So, um, but maybe I misunderstood your, your comment. Um, my concern is how to, how to interact with colleagues that are uh, working in bilingualism and they are kind of puzzled with the definition of heritage speakers saying that uh, anyone could become a heritage speakers during the lifetime and uh, that we kind of base our, the, the very use of uh, by, uh, balanced bilingual or unbalanced bilingual is criticizable. Yes, I, I don't think that you become a, I mean, not a court in my world, you don't become and a heritage speaker, you are a heritage speaker by definition because you inherit a language um, by your parents. So um, yeah, and how it goes in terms of 
balancing or balance that's a matter of what you're exposed to okay thank you thank you i guess we can move on to alexia's question yes can you hear me Okay, first of all, thank you for this very interesting debate. And my question is more of general nature from a more social uh, point of view. And I would really like to ask, uh, um, how can uh, we resolve the uh, very common problem among linguists? That is how to convey the results of the academical research to the lay people and also share the importance of these findings also in order to change the lay people point of view about heritage languages uh, about for example also code switching which is a very common phenomenon also nowadays we live in a multicultural multilingual world so we can also lay people can understand the importance of heritage language but how can we um, convey this result in a more simple and understandable way to this public. And I would like to ask your opinion about that. I start and then you can add something if you want, Tanya. Well, I think that's a good question and I think it's very important to do so. And there are multiple ways of, of doing it. Uh, one way of doing it is as many of people, including those present here are doing it is through the bilingualism matters initiative that uh, that's coming out of edinburgh uh, where you actively engage with the public and, and you give talks and presentations about these kind of issues in a way that they can understand and appreciate them and another related and potentially overlapping way to do it which i've done a lot of is to go to schools uh, and talk to uh, students uh, about this. And, and, and I've talked about many of the same things that I've talked about here, you know, how we can use this data as a resource, how there are patterns, uh, and how uh, it actually, in the case of American Norwegian, the interesting thing is that it also looks like the way teenagers speak in Norway these days, because they mix a lot of English into their Norwegian. So I can then show them the similarities and differences between the American Norwegian speakers, who are, you know, between 17 and, and 100 years of age, and their own language, uh, which they're using, and, and they get very flabbergasted when I do that. Uh, but I think that's another way of doing it, where you can reach out, and you can write, um, you know, columns in newspapers papers and so on. And I think it's important that we do it because people are very interested um, and they need to learn and especially health personnel need to learn because there are a lot of prejudices among nurses and others uh, uh, that especially parents meet uh, when their kids are young. And I think they need to be better educated about these effects and understand the naturalness in the sense of being bilingual and everything that comes with it uh, and, and the systematicity of it, that it's not dangerous that they mix languages, for example. But Tanya, you might want to add something. Yeah, I think um, teacher training is, um, is key in this. Um, because you, um, I mean, teachers, language teachers, including language teachers, so sometimes heritage speakers end up in language classes and the teachers tell them that their, their Italian is horrible. And um, uh, the problem is that the teachers, they come uh, from another country, they're typically monolingual teachers, and they see themselves as ambassadors who defend the, um, the standard language. And I think that's good um, that they do because a certain registers needed to work in an academic context. So it's also their job. But I think people have to become more tolerant with respect to other varieties. So Italian is such a good example because um, our heritage speakers here are their goal. They sometimes speak three different varieties um, and um, it's fascinating in addition to standard Italian, um, but the teachers don't value that. So these speakers think of themselves as being not such good speakers of Italian. So I think um, it's key to reach out to teachers, of course, also to parents. You, I mean, once the teachers say something, then that, that's transmitted to the parents because teachers are an, an authority and I'm, I'm doing teacher training myself. So I'm trying to tell my students exactly these things. Thank you a lot. If I may add something else. So, um, do you think that also introducing some linguistic concepts in, uh, in the school would help uh, a greater understanding of how language works? So I personally think yes, but do you think so? Yes, um, 
um, both sociolinguistics but also formal linguistics can help because um, of course, I mean, you have to be careful not to scare them off with too much theory, um, but you, if you give it to them in portions, if, if you show how it can be useful to understand that what speakers do is, is, um, uh, is rule-based, it's not that they, that they have a broken grammar, it's something that they do systematically, I think that helps, yeah. Okay. Sorry, but we've we've got to move move on. Sorry. Um, I think there's uh, um, um, there's something that uh, Terry want, wanted to add with respect to Ana Maria de Schulo's question. Well, that was a it was a very big question, and and I think we could have given an entire lecture uh, in response to that that question. But I think it's an important question, um, and and I think one way of looking at it is that uh, that there is a lot of variation and. And the fact that the, we have theoretical models that make predictions is a very useful tool in investigating this. So if you look at what has happened since your important paper on code switching until today, uh, increased corpora and new questions from different, you know, from developments within the minimalist program, say, have enabled us to discover that the variation is much greater, for example, than it was uh, than it was in the past. So we we sort of need to take the lead from from theory. But that said, I think the overall point that I that I thought you were making as well, namely that there isn't anything unique that they do in terms of the human language capacity, right? That's that's also well taken, that they seem to to do things that we find elsewhere as well, which which is important. Yes. I okay. think yes, I agree. I agree, agree. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Let me just um, uh, devote some time to a, a, a question in the chat, which is uh, from Aubrey Nunes. Uh, she asks, um, is it worth distinguishing between the amount of L at first L1 input and, and whether that input is restricted to questions about food, et cetera, thus excluding matters of great community significance? Can, if I can tr try. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what you mean by um, great community significance. Um, um, so this is, if I understand it correctly, this is a question about vocabulary. Um, so um, yes, the less vocabulary exposure you get, the less your vocabulary will grow. Um, yeah, that's what I would um, expect. And it's also, um, uh, yeah, it's in a way, this is nothing that formal theories would um, highlight. Um, vocabularies in um, in monolinguals also differ greatly. So um, we probably all have different uh, vocabulary sizes, even if we speak the same native language. So um, yes, I would expect that. Um, I don't know if you want to consider it of great significance. It depends on what you want to do with the language. So if you want to enter university, you need um, a different vocabulary. So that's, for example, a problem that heritage speakers have. They don't have much um, scientific um, vocabulary or formal vocabulary. And they sometimes they, they don't know all the registers. And that may look like um, they don't have full command of the language. But um, the truth is that they just lack certain registers. And it has a lot to do with vocabulary. So it depends on what you want to do with the language, I would say. OK, thank you. Terry, would you like to add something to this? Or? No, okay. So I see no more questions. So uh, I've, I've got a question myself, if I may. So um, basically, um, uh, at a certain point, uh, Terry um, uh, hinted at the, uh, at the fact that even monolingual can be a source of change, in a sense. So basically, we are not uh, forced to look into the uh, into the grammars of uh, of um, of heritage speakers to uh, actually uh, see changes happening. So my question is basically a follow up uh, of Alessandro Somazelli's question on verb second. So I was quite interested in uh, in, uh, in in the loss of, or in the vulnerability of verb second in, in Norwegian um, uh, heritage speakers. But I, I have also in my I, I mean I, I'm also um, uh, taking in I mean I'm also thinking of um, the loss of verb second, for example, in certain registers of German. So, for example, in Dietz-Deutsch and so on. So my question is a very broad one. Um, to what extent can uh, 
uh, the pressure exerted by a majority language speed up some kind of change that would happen anyway, in a sense. So I'm not saying that the German, standard German is going to be a non-verb second language, but in certain register, uh, I mean, verb second is vulnerable. Um, can you can you say something about the, uh, I mean, the speed at which certain changes um, 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 happen in heritage languages, and if if the pressure exerted by the majority language plays a role in this? I, I think the the short answer answer is that it really does, and and a way of of justifying that is to look at, at what Haugen uh, said in 1953, where he said that all speakers had their verb second intact. He didn't find any deviations um, from verb second. And now we find uh, quite a lot of deviations uh, in general. Um, and the major difference that has changed uh, or compared uh, or major difference between those generations is the usage where because in the 1930s and the 1940s you had the dedicated communities that used Norwegian daily they learned Norwegian before they went to school and that all changed after the second world war when uh, when they stopped learning Norwegian and the parents stopped transferring the language to them um, so so I think the dominant uh, and the use of the of the dominant language and the majority language together uh, plays a really uh, crucial role um, because there are plenty of other bilinguals um, who acquire Norwegian and English, say, uh, and even if they struggle as kids, they often end up you know, maintaining the system just as you would expect them to. So it's not the case that there is anything given about verb second being so vulnerable because there's so much evidence in the input, I guess. Yeah, that's a short way of, of looking at it. Thanks. Okay, Tanya, I guess you have- Yeah, I want to just want to add examples. So um, looking at uh, the domain of DPs, uh, the, uh, if you look at the terminus, there are examples that uh, from one generation to the next, for example, Mandarin speakers living in the Netherlands, they start using the definite, uh, the demonstrative in an anaphoric uh, context. So this typically, if you look at um, traditional works like Renzi's, um, uh, the, the, story, the, the story, the history of the definite article, it takes about 200 years from Latin um, to move ahead to that stage. And in heritage speakers, you see it really from one generation to the next. So there are studies uh, comparing across generations and you see an overuse of definites in the, in, in the anaphoric function. And um, the same has been shown for the indefinite in, in Turkish, in heritage Turkish. So the numeral bir is overused in uh, context where they are used to identify specific reference. So I think this is super fascinating um, to see how it happens under the contact language. And really, um, you see it comparing across generations. And yeah, there it is in your data. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I don't see no more. Uh, I don't see any other any other questions uh, in the chat. No. Uh, do I see a raised hand? So I guess we can uh, thank again our um, discussants, so Tanya Kupisch and Terje Lundal. And um, I would like to leave the floor to Cecilia, who has some announcements for, for us, for all of us. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you everybody for making this flash mob once again very interesting. Before we close this last flash mob uh, before uh, the summer break, let me advertise our uh, new initiative. It's an intensive remote school that is run by the Linguistic Flashmob Group. It will be at the, you know, from the 24th to the 29th of January uh, uh, 2022nd, and subscriptions will start from September the 1st. Uh, uh, PhD students, advanced master students are very welcome. The school will be online on Zoom run by the group, as I said, and we are going to send around the announcement on those. And now, thank you everybody, the organizing committee, our younger people who help us. We see each other on the 23rd of September and happy summer to everybody. <laughs>